In the name of God, <clears throat> creator, redeemer, sustainer. This year, we are going to commemorate the 50-year anniversary of ordination of the first women priests in the Episcopal Church. The idea of being called into such a vocation is so very difficult to articulate or even believe to the individual and often to others. Moses also had his doubts. There is a line in Exodus where he asks, where he asks God, who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. We should also note that Moses was entering into this unimaginable leadership assignment when he was 80 years old. And Aaron, his brother and spokesperson, was 83. I will be with you. If you have felt a sense of call, have you ever wondered about that, if it's really true? I definitely have. So tonight, I want to confess to you that it was a big stretch for this home economics education graduate to step into the ethereal realm of theological studies. I'm practical and a keen observer of the obvious. <laughs> I'm a person who follows recipes and finds food experimentation definitely beyond my call. I like things that are tangible, like yarn, fabric, and books. In the Women's Army Corps, I love the neat order of marching and calling cadence to keep my 200 basic training troops on the right foot. Although, ironically, you may not know it, but you always start marching with your left foot. For a home at grad, today's lessons on the surface come down to the basics. A recipe for a roasted lamb. DIY decorating on the doorposts. <laughs> Hosting a gathering of friends and family, sharing a meal, and practicing hygiene. But today's lessons call for us to go <coughs> far below the surface. In seminary, one of our assignments was to visit churches that were um, familiar, that were not familiar to us. When we again met in class, our professor wanted us to describe our experience. So we would begin by telling about our outward first impressions, like how easy it was to park. What was the architecture like? And then we proceeded from there, going into the church, what we observed about the people and the worship space and the music. When we thought we had pretty much said it all, Professor Ashbrook would say, what else? And we dig a little deeper. Again, he'd say, what else? By the time he'd asked that question several more times, we were getting ready to revolt. <laughs> but we got the point that there was so much that we had missed at first. I can definitely imagine Moses asking, what else? to God as his to-do list keeps getting larger. In today's Exodus reading, we get to the climax of the story where Pharaoh finally lets the Israelites go. But before that, there had been hard negotiations, broken promises, and destruction throughout Egypt. How far does a person or a nation have to go before it is broken, before it surrenders, gives in, and admits defeat. Will that happen in Ukraine, or Haiti, or Gaza? For Egypt, it took snakes. The Nile River turned to blood and blood over everything. Frogs, and then huge piles of dead frogs stinking and rotting gnats, 
swarms of flies, death of livestock, dust coating everything, locusts, and three days of utter darkness. And I imagine if it had been in Minnesota, it would have been black flies and mosquitoes as well. <laughs> Through all that, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And sometimes God hardened Pharaoh's heart and ignored Moses' pleas to let my people go. Imagine the suffering the Egyptians bore with in the refusal to let enslaved people be free. We might spend a moment of care for the Egyptians, but we know that slavery also always has a high cost. While they may not always have been enslaved, we need only look to our borders to see the thousands of people who still seek the promised land and freedom. For Pharaoh and the Egyptians, the high cost finally hits far below the surface and touches their utmost depth. It is the death of the firstborn all across the land that finally opens Pharaoh's hard heart. All the firstborn, that is, except for the Israelites, who had been ready for this Passover by painting the lintels of their homes with the blood of the sacrificial animals. In Bob Dylan's song, Blowing in the Wind, released in 1963, he asks, how many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? And how many deaths will it take till we know that too many people have died? The answers that will never be known to us are still blowing in the wind. Even so, we continue to trust that spirit of God blowing in the wind and God's promise to Moses, I will be with you. And for their part, the Jews believed that message and continued to celebrate the festival of the Passover. And that is where we find Jesus, centuries after Moses. Jesus and his disciples were gathered together to celebrate the Passover and to retell the story of the Israelites' release from slavery in Egypt. But in Jerusalem, they were once again under the rule of foreign powers, the Romans, who did not want people to be riled up and did not want them following this unknown rabbi from the sticks. At supper, Jesus, knowing he had little time left, gets up, probably from reclining at the table, partially undresses and wraps a towel around himself. Then he does this astonishing thing of washing his friend's feet. This is an act of intimacy far beyond the norm of social interaction. I once did a workshop on clothing your spirit where we talked about how our clothes reflected our inner spirit and how we may, might make some changes to make our outsides be a better reflection of our insides. In fact, there are several members here at St. John's who catch my eye every week for their fine selection of clothes and accessories, and I think they know who they are. <laughs> One of the questions I asked at the workshop was, what clothes were you made to wear. There was an outpouring of poignant stories about hand-me-downs and the wills of parents overriding the wants and needs of their children. Saddest of all were the shoe stories as ill-fitting shoes caused lasting damage to feet. <coughs> so I'd like to take a little survey at this point. How many of you are happy with your feet? I want to see it. It's a very small number here tonight. And I chose to ask that instead of the how many are unhappy with your feet. While there is usually great reluctance to bear one's feet to be washed here in church, 
For me, it has always been a humbling privilege to continue Jesus' example of this intimate act. Over and over again, Jesus crosses over and strips away previously accepted standards of social distance with permission for intimacy. He touches and heals lepers and women. He welcomes children and the mentally ill. He talks about death. So now let us come back to our question of what else that leads to us below the surface. It is not just enough to be polite to people who look like us. It is not for us, enough for us to simply give thanks to someone who does a favor like opening a door. It is not even enough to generously tip a restaurant server. Now he gives us this new commandment that we are to love one another stepping out of our comfort zone of politeness and distance, even though we're Minnesotans, no longer living safely at the surface, surface, but reaching out to connect deeply. We are called to open our hard hearts and to take the chance to bear not only our feet, but our hearts and minds too. This Holy Week brings us face to face with so many emotions that pull us below the comfort of the surface. Thinking of below the surface, I have been unable to let go of the image of cars and people in the river below the Baltimore Bridge collapse. Soon we will recall Jesus' Last Supper with his friends as we share bread and wine then, after hymns and prayers, we will strip away the beautiful outward signs of our tradition and liturgy, brass, crystal, silver, and linen. But this emptying will also allow us to return to basics with no distractions, to meet one another face to face, to be fully present, and to give and receive love. May it be so.